Howdy, y'all. Um, welcome to the Nom Talk Network's Blazing Saddles. I'm going to drop the accent because I'm just going to butcher the living shit out of that. And uh, Cleavon Little did not have an accent, so I will never, ever, ever try and uh, do anything as good as he did in this movie. Uh, but yes, <laughs> welcome to Blazing Saddles. Uh, I'm your host, Mike Manalo, and I'm very excited uh, for today's show because I am a huge, huge, huge Mel Brooks fan. Um, and uh, I'm here with fellow Mel Brooks fans as well to talk about one of the seminal comedies ever put to film. And, uh, you know, uh, by, by one of the greatest comedic filmmakers and comedic masterminds of our time, uh, Mr. Mel Brooks. Uh, before we get started, I do, you, I, you guys will probably notice that I have a screen cap from one of uh, Mel Brooks's best movies, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Uh, and it is a screen cap of Prince John himself, uh, the great Richard Lewis, who we lost today. Uh, so I just wanted to pay tribute to him and all of the amazing work that he's done, especially in Robin Hood Men in Tights and all of the amazing, wonderful comedies that he's done. Curb Your Enthusiasm, Anything But Love. Uh, so many I could list them all. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll miss we'll miss uh, one of the best voices in comedy uh, of our time uh, as of today. But thankfully, uh, we are here to talk about another uh, great voice of our time, which is Mel Brooks and Blazing Saddles. And to do that, I've got the best panel ever, uh, starting with my good friend, Jen Athey. How are you doing, Jen? And uh, would you like to give yourself an intro? Sure. Um, I'm doing great. I'm doing better now. <laughs> um, I am Jen Athey, and I am thrilled to be here. I have, oh, look who joined us just in time, my buddy. Charlie Aww. is here. He's very excited. He also watched Hi, Blazing Saddles. He learned some new words that we don't I'm say sure in this house. Ah. So, uh, you know, he was a little shocked about that when I had to have a talk with him. But yeah, so um, I'm excited. I love Mel Brooks. I was really sad. It was funny because I was thinking earlier when I heard about Richard Lewis, um, his energy and Madeline Kahn's energy and a lot of things are very similar. So mm -hmm. I had made that yeah. connection in my head and then that made me think more about the movie. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to tonight and our discussion. I'm looking forward to us talking about this and to having, having you and Charlie on the call as well to discuss this, Jen. So thank you. Um, Julie, would you like to give yourself an intro? Yes. Hi, I'm Julie. And um, I have a little bit of a, food inspired uh, from the movie. I was inspired by the food fight scene at the end with some <laughs> um, creamed corn and mashed potatoes. Excellent. And then I thought, what else goes with that? And also goes with Westerns, but a burger. So I got a little burger. It is a falafel burger because that is all I had in my freezer. So we're making it work, but I think it's going to be good. And then also inspired by the food fight scene, I have a banana cream pie. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I love yeah. it. And then I am just drinking water. Hope everyone's doing good tonight. <laughs> uh, we're definitely doing good. Even better now that we get to talk to you guys. Um, <laughs> by the way, Jen, are you eating or drinking anything? So um, my afternoon was a little chaotic. We were like three people short at work today. So I am eating tortillas with butter and sugar like a grown-up um i also have a still as of yet an open oh, it looks like i'm blurring the chips for their protection um, <laughs> trader Do joe's um dill pickle potato mm. chips no they're good and i thought i grabbed a hard root beer and then i took a big drink and it was a, um, a pretzel a wheat shop top which is a very different flavor profile <laughs> so I'm wow. having a night, you guys. Wow. It is it is a terrific flavor profile though. I do like it's delicious. the delicious. That's delicious. It's just it's really very salty. savory and salty um, <laughs> compared to root beer, which I thought was gonna fit the Western theme. And it's not root beer though, but still good. So still good. Um, I'm trying to mellow out. <laughs> um yeah, I, I think it's perfect and sounds tasty. Um Derek, what about you, buddy? Do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, where are all the white women at? Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> right there. <laughs> Two. Um, Two. Yeah. Hi, hi, everybody. I'm very excited uh, to be back. Uh, I am eating uh, just just a healthy uh, healthy little snack. Uh, it's just uh, what is this? Ground turkey, uh, peppers, squash, a little bit of avocado mixed up, and then I'm lame and I'm just drinking water. Mm. So nothing lame about water. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, love it, love it. I could wish I could say yeah. There's water too. 
I wish I could say that I was eating and drinking something, but in my rush to get on the podcast, I was like, do I need the snack or the hat? Which one should I prioritize? <laughs> I'll let you guys figure out what I came to the conclusion. Uh, <laughs> but um, that being said, uh, yeah, let's talk about this movie. You know what? I, I literally did not see this coming through until now. But our good friend, Heartless, who is on the chat, and also our good friend, Q-Ball. Hey, Q-Ball. Hey, Heartless. How are you guys doing? Uh, but hey, Heartless guys. has redeemed Sing Mode. So <laughs> I, oh, no. you know, which which I really hate, Eric, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> oh, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like if we're going to redeem sing mode for a movie like this, there's only one way to do it. We just got to be like, he rode a blazing saddle, <laughs> a shining star, his job to offer battle to bad men near and far. Don't don't do I knew the words better. <laughs> I, I literally I knew the words better. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I googled it right now. Uh, <laughs> And I was going to sing the whole song <clears throat> for the entirety Heartless, of sing mode so bitch. that we could just should I just do and it? It's coming for you one day. <laughs> I I I hate that mode. We need to just remove it from the chat, but we gotta give the people what they want, I guess. Yep. Anyways, hopefully that was good enough for you, Heartless. Um twice, but yeah. twice in three days. Twice it, in three days. It, people just love it, damn it. I know. Um we're never gonna I don't get, get rid that of it. one very often. I actually don't mind that one as much as like third person or the pun one. <laughs> I'll, I'll take I'll take third person over over singing. I'll take the pun one because I, I speak I, in puns no, anyway. I'd rather have the <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, getting back to the matter at hand, um, I think it's also fair. We we talked about food. Uh, we got to talk about another food, which is popcorn. Uh, and our popcorn ratings of this movie. Um, so I'm going to start with Derek. Uh, how many popcorns do you give Blazing Saddles? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to give it four out of five. Um, I, I agree that this is one of the seminal comedies of the last 50 years. Um, if you look on pretty much any list, uh, Blazing Saddles will pretty much crack the top 100 um, on most of them. I, I think the only one it doesn't is like Sight and Sound, but those movies are weird as hell. So I can understand why <laughs> Blazing Saddles isn't on there. Um, but, and it's also considered, you know, one of the best comedies and satires uh, of all time. I, and it, um, you know, so I, I genuinely, I, I know, um, uh, I, know, I know my colleague here, uh, she was kind of going up and down between 3.5 and 4. Um, and, and I, too, actually was struggling with that a little bit. But I decided to go with a 4 um, just because I think that there are there are some really, really good strengths in this film um, that uh, truly deconstruct an era in, in just some absolute genius ways. Um, so, yeah, uh, 4 out of 5 for me. <clears throat> awesome. Um, that I, we Julie? If you're okay with it, I'm going to get to you last because I feel like you have the most controversial of the ratings here. <laughs> uh, but I, I, in, in a good way, because I feel like you're going to have a lot to say and I really want to hear it. Um, but before I get to you, Jen, uh, popcorn rating for you. So I gave this one a 4.5. Um, I, I have a couple other Mel Brooks movies I would have given solid fives to. Mm. I, I really like this movie. Um, I hadn't watched it in a long time. And I, I, there are just words I have a, an aversion to, even in context. Of course. <laughs> Especially in context sometimes, <laughs> depending on the context. Um, so I guess I had forgotten. <laughs> it took me, I almost turned it on. I'm like, no, no. But um, <laughs> I, the, the genius of the writing in this movie <laughs> the anachronisms the way they they play with like they put stuff in here that's just so out of time and i don't know there's just something about the way they wrote this movie the jokes the i don't know everything the puns the self-referentialism that's not a word see i had just one <laughs> giant gulp of beer and i've lost my mind um <laughs> Three people short at work today, guys, and I'm like brand, brand new baby frog mm -hmm. investigator world. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're doing uh, so, great for what it's worth. You know, it's, <laughs> yes, it's Mel Mel Brooks. His his satire, his ability to kind of talk about social issues to a point where you don't even really know you're having a discussion about social issues. Um, it's now I don't. 
my friend actually was telling me her husband put this movie on the other day and their kids are like seven and 10. And I'm like, I don't know that I would have put it on for seven and 10, but my kids are in their early twenties, mid twenties. So, you know, and they, my daughter goes, what movie is that? And I was like, get out of, get out. You're not my kid. <laughs> um, but my son, my son's very familiar with all films. So, you know, he and I can have a conversation about it and it's just, a, it's a good movie. It's fun. You, it's not preachy but you can still take away a good, a good lesson from it. And it's, it's written that the cast is fantastic. I mean, Madeline Kahn, like we said, um, it just the, the Hedley Lamar thing and how Hedy Lamar got so mad about it, but then they're like, okay, you're going to get mad because sort of the name sounds like yours. Come on, get out of here. You know, it's just, it's just so clever. He's so clever and he's always so, so, on on topic I don't know I just want to hug him I always just want to hug Mel Brooks but this movie just was so I don't know topical so well done and so just funny and it holds up Mm. and there are people who are like no it's so offensive I'm like but it's not you have to watch it and understand it if you think it's offensive Mm -hmm. you missed the point yeah Mm -hmm. but that's all his movies right so no I just I really I like this movie a lot I, I concur. Uh, and and honestly, I gave it a five out of five. Um, honestly, there's just a wit and and a brilliance to everything that Mel Gibson. Um, sorry, Mel Brooks. Whoa. Sorry, different racist. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Mel, Mel Brooks does. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, More offensive than the Hadley Hadley, like than the Hadley Hadley Lamar. That's that's just way completely too completely different. Yeah, that's. Different. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, yes, uh, but um, there's there's a, there's a wit and a brilliance to everything that Mel Brooks Mel Brooks does. You meant different western. You meant different western. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 honestly, everything, every line in this movie, the double entendres, the puns, the the cleverness of it all, mixed with so you know. You could be so smart and so brilliant and then completely undercut himself with something sophomoric like the bean scene, uh, which is hilarious still. And just the fact that you've got all of these comedies working together, um, Looney Tunes type comedy, very, very witty dialogue, very, very hilarious, like bathroom humor and everything. It's the high, it's the juxtaposition of high and low art mm-hmm. um, working at play here to make a symphony of brilliance and that's that's one of the reasons why i just love this and why i've given it a five um i i do agree with you jen and i do agree with you derek that like uh we were having a conversation um even before this started about how we grew up with other mel brooks movies that we've seen probably infinitely more and we love admittedly and replay infinitely more um young frankenstein for me uh i think Spaceballs uh for all for all of us uh brahmin hood men tights for all of us as well and those are definitely things that are going to stay with us and and be fives forever for us because of how good they are and because of how much they mean to us. But uh, Blazing Saddles walked. It blazed a saddle um, so that the rest <laughs> of these could actually like uh, run, you know, and, yeah. and I think that that's that's one of the greatest things ever about Mel Brooks. This this movie and Young Frankenstein, they came out the same year. They made his career and they basically helped. The, the the subgenre of the spoof movie um in prominence into huge huge prominence and and i for that uh and for its 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 impact on cinematic history and the cinematic comedy uh i had to give this a five um but julie i wanted to save you for last not not for any terrible terrible reason but because i <laughs> definitely want to hear uh your thoughts about the movie and your popcorn score uh what would you what would you reveal that for the audience? Sure. So <laughs> um I gave it a 3.5. And as um Derek was saying earlier, I was very torn. Um I so uh reasons I was torn. Um well it is a very it's a very, very good movie. It is a solid comedy, it is pretty much a perfect example of a satire, as you were saying. Um, you know, it, so like as for that goes and like the way that the movie was made and how groundbreaking it was great 
But I think it's just more for me, like I, like you were saying, I have other Mel Brooks movies that I think I like better. So it just seems like if we're going based on a rating system of like which ones. And also like I kind of reserve my fours and fives for like my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. And I don't think that I could say that this was one of my favorite movies of all time, but I do enjoy it. I enjoyed rewatching it mm -hmm. because it's been a while since I've watched it. I was like, oh, I forgot about this joke. I forgot about this one. It's good. I also was going to say there, like Jen was saying this, she has an aversion to certain words. I, I would say that too, like, I don't want to, but like, you know, you just kind of are conditioned to things that you're just like, oh, okay, that's, yeah. you know, but in context, I don't see any other way that it could have been done. But yeah, yeah. so there's a, those are my multitude of reasons for my score, but I, it's a solid movie. I love Mel Brooks and it's a good, it's a good Mel Brooks movie, so. I respect it so much, too, because I think something that we don't talk about enough, especially when we talk about films and we talk about film criticism in general, um, we have this idea that, like, your rating, love and appreciation all have to be mutually exclusive. Like, they all have to mm, align. Yeah. Um, and they don't. Like, I have plenty of films that I appreciate more than <laughs> I love. And I can recognize yeah. their place in the overarching world of cinema and their impact on cinema and still say, yeah, I don't, but I don't love this. I don't go out and rewatch Blazing Saddles um, on yeah. a regular basis. That has nothing to do. It's not an indictment of the film itself because right. it's a great movie that I just tend to appreciate more because I do have other Mel Brooks films that are, are just more relatable to our generation. One of the things we we're talking about off air is we didn't, in our generation for the most part, like, the Western genre was already dead by the time yeah. we were old enough to even watch Blazing Saddles. So we didn't grow up in the 50s and 60s where, or even 40s where Westerns were thriving and Mel Brooks comes in and just obliterates it, like just absolutely sets the genre on fire. But our generation grew up with Star Wars. That was our first intro into sci-fi. So when Spaceballs comes around and obliterates something that we have a very deep connection to, we're much more likely to give something that personally and ob objectively, I would say, isn't even that good of a movie, isn't even that good of a satire, um, but it has more meaning to me because I recognize all of those things that he's messing around with and all of those things that he's making fun of because I have a much more direct connection with his source material than I do on Westerns. Everything I know about Westerns is from my own film history and going back and looking at him so I can appreciate it, but I don't love it as much as the deep connections I have with the other things that he makes fun of, so... A hundred percent. And, and Julie, you know, by the way, I didn't, I didn't save you for last to, to shame the popcorn rating. If anything, it's Oh, the no worries. I didn't yeah. think you it's, did. Oh, perfect. <laughs> by the way, sorry, I, I, I temporarily went off camera. My roommate knocked on my door, which caused a chain reaction of my camera falling and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Your roommate anyway. Mel Gibson, right? Um, no, I'm I'm joking. Yes. Um, <laughs> we talking about racism in here. <laughs> that's what that um, was. Yeah, that's. That was. That's. The, I mean, you say Mel Gibson and Train reaction. Everybody kind of assumes, anyways. Um, but but yeah, no, no. Um, uh, Julie, no, I I I love that popcorn, obviously, and I love that yeah, you, you 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 put it at that for such personal reasons too. That's the entire reason that we're here. We are talking about what this movie means to us and what other movies mean to us. That's the whole basis of, of basic binges and nom talk. And uh, I, I oh. love that uh, explanation uh, because you're right. Here's the thing, as much as I love this movie and I, I did give it a five because of its achievement for, uh, you know, in cinematic history, if you were to ask me, would I take this with me on Desert Island? Would this make the Desert Island cut? Um, uh, and I, I, I actually don't think I would. I, I don't think I would. I think Robin Hood or Spaceballs might have a better shot at, yeah. at mm -hmm. it and, and Young Frankenstein, too. Uh, do I love this movie with all my heart? Absolutely. But you're right. This wouldn't necessarily be a Desert Island movie for me. I think I'm, I'm, I'm still sticking with the five. But I the, the way that the reason and the way that you explained why it's a three and a half for you, 100 percent makes makes so much sense. And, and yeah. I love that um, completely. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> I do think so. <laughs> Um, I definitely want to chat about, uh, I, I think it's important for us to talk about this movie in the context of, um, Jen, as, as you kind of put it, there's definitely humor and, 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 you know, this is not a racist movie. This is not, you know, I think that that's what people sometimes tend to misconstrue because terms are used throughout the movie that we don't talk, mm -hmm. or we don't say anymore. Um, but to me, this is really the antithesis of that. It's, it's, 
it's subverting the expectations and the culture at the time and kind of shunning it and showing yes. us how those sort of uh, racist and ignorant beliefs are the stupidest moronic things that we could ever point to in society or try in society. And I wanted to kind of kick it, um, Jen, especially since since you kind of started off the conversation. Um, I mean, what do you think about this? If we were to anal analyze um, Blazing Saddles and it's, you know, it, it's biting satire, uh, satirical elements today. Um, what are your thoughts on all of that and, and how you kind of perceive um, what Mel's trying to convey in this movie and everything like that? So. I have an upbringing where I worked hard to shake free of the things that I heard growing up. I'm trying to be as diplomatic as humanly. <laughs> of course. Of course. Let's just say there were some people in my life as I was growing up who wouldn't use those words satirically necessarily. Mm. Um, but I even from a young age, understood that words had power in a bad way and a good way. And I did, from that young age, also understood that I didn't have to believe those same things. So as I got older, I started standing up against that person and, and kind of pushing back with it, especially after I had kids. I was like, nope, you don't say that in front of my kids. Yeah. We don't talk about things like that in front of my kids. I'm not raising my kids that way. I don't believe those things. I don't feel that way myself. Um, and so it's um, it, that's, I think, why when I heard it, I was like, it was my instinct to be like, no, 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 we don't, no, we don't say that. Um, but I actually sat down and I did some Googling about the movie because I was like, how was that? Okay. Okay. I know it's a satire, but you know, I mean, uh, I, I know it was a different time. Uh, and there's just a couple other things too. Like the, the K, the KKK robes. I'm like, uh, even though it was like satire, I'm still like, Whoa. but um, I have, you know, I have to remember things can be comedic for, for comedy's sake and satire's sake. And then I was like, Oh, I didn't know Richard Pryor helped write this movie. Which puts it in a whole other light because Richard Pryor's comedy, if you've ever seen it from the 70s and 80s, is a whole thing. And wow. Oof. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh <laughs> yeah, boy. A that's, a, that's a rabbit hole. Oh yeah. boy. <laughs> you need a towel and some water and maybe some <laughs> yeah. holy water. I mean, I, my, my parents were less than careful and cautious about what I was allowed to watch growing up. I saw Eddie Murphy raw when I was very young. Yeah. I saw Richard Pryor's stand up when I was very young. I watched movies. My parents were like, sure, just watch it. Just watch this, watch that. I watched so many things that I probably shouldn't have at very young ages and not supervised. Just like, yeah, you just, if it was on, I could watch it. And um, so I got exposed to a lot that maybe I shouldn't have, not horror movies or very violent movies, but just comedies. So I saw a lot, I saw The Jerk. I saw, um, oh, what's the movie with, where they're deaf and blind? You know, just like where it's it's Richard Pryor and um, Willie Hear Walker. no evil, see no evil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all these different comedies that nowadays could never get made. So it sort of informed my comedy, but it also kind of let me see, nah, maybe that's not, you know, it's not so great. And so I, I kind of grew up being able to filter and, and looking back at this, I can see where they're making fun of it. So I was able to sit back and rewatch it and be like, okay, okay. I see what you're doing here. Oh, I see mm -hmm. what that I get. Oh, okay. I see. I get, get what that is. Um, and the genius of Mel being able to write it like that back then mm -hmm. where the sensibilities were very different and, you know, we have a, a look at what we have now. I mean, my company has a diversity, equity, and inclusion department, and we have trainings that you can take. We require, I, I work for a healthcare plan. We require our doctors to do annual training in, in DEI um, to stay paneled with us. Like, I mean, it take, our, my company takes it very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's something that I think back then, if someone had suggested a DEI training, <laughs> you know, the, the white men in the offices would have laughed you out of, 
out of their smack their secretary's asses and then <laughs> turn back to their scotch and, and cigarettes yeah. at one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just, it's, it was so ahead of its time. Mm. It, it really was. And Mel has always been ahead of his time. His humor has always shown that Richard Pryor was ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's there's such a uh, there's such a relevance when uh, particularly one of the things that I think holds up is not just the comedy but I think his commentary on racism kind of like you were talking about Mike where he he really does just point the finger back at racism in general and just kind of he has no intention of solving it um, and so this whole satire and this whole comedy is really just to point out how stupid it is um, and I think the only way to do that is to really like demonstrate. The racism of the time in, in its yeah. fullness like in its completeness you can't you can't just skirt around it like if you're gonna call it out then like yeah you absolutely have to call it out from the beginning um so i, I really appreciated that in, in this film in particular like going back and rewatching it um because not only does it still hold up in comedy but all of its commentary <laughs> about racism and and all all of that like you could apply that to exactly everything that's happening today forget the strides yeah. we've made like forget all of that. Like you, you should still be able to watch this and be like, "Wow, I actually know those people still." And we, I thought we were past this, and yeah. we're not. Um, and so I think that's one of the brilliant things of this film. I think too, I know, I, and this is something that has always frustrated me about the conversation with this movie um, is people saying things like, "Oh, you could never get this made today." Um, and, and I don't know if you've watched enough movies, um, but this is not the only movie to use the N word. Um, in, in, and I, I, I just implore you, if you think it is just watch any Tarantino movie, any Quentin Tarantino, yeah. just pick one. Yeah. And it does, like you're going you're gonna to be blown away by what we can get away with today and get an Oscar nominated film with that word being used infinitely more. Um, but there's also a, a, a particularly with something like Django Unchained, um, there's a, a clear trajectory of what we're doing satirically in Blazing Saddles paves the way for us to do seriously in something like Django Unchained, where it's doing something very similar. It's doing that exact same subversion. It's making the it's making the the, the person of color the smartest man in the room. Um, yes. So it, it's got a lot of those similarities. So I, I think this, this knee-jerk reaction of like, Oh, you can't say that. Well, like, okay, but you can though. Like, in in the right yeah. context, you absolutely can, and we do, and we do still. There are plenty of movies that deal with racism, that deal with racists, that deal with all of these different kinds of things that we've been talking about. Um, that ramp it up. Even I thought my memory of Blazing Saddles was that was that this was like every other word was was that word, and and rewatching it uh, again today, I was like. Well, it's really not like, yes, yeah. for the time, yeah. for sure. People yeah. were like, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes. Um, but this idea that like you can't make Blazing the only reason you can't make Blazing Saddles today is because we already have Blazing Saddles. Okay. There's just no reason to <laughs> yeah. move forward and make yeah. it again because it, it stands alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it stands alone and it, it doesn't need to be remade. So the mic would like to point out that Heartless Redeemed talk in third person. So the mic is going to have to talk in third person for the duration. You did that of... on purpose, didn't you, Eric? <laughs> Eric Derek, Derek is so glad he got his rant out before you claim this, Heartless. <laughs> Mike, Mike knew what you were doing. Mike knew what you were doing. Uh, <laughs> but but um, no, no, no. I mean, like, uh, sorry. Um, Mike thinks that... Um, this is so freaking hard. Um, uh, <laughs> so the, the, the thing about oh, yeah. the use of the N-word in this movie is that the people who are saying it are the terrible individuals in this movie. Mm -hmm. They're the bad mm -hmm. guys or the villains or the people that are just, you're never going to root for them. They're cowardly. They're stupid. They're dumb. By making uh, Bart the smartest character in this movie, not just the smartest character, the most noble character in this movie, um, despite the fact, this is a very X-Men kind of thing, despite the fact that he's re received all of this discrimination, all this hatred, he's still standing up for this town. Right. Everybody wants to call it quits. <clears throat> Everybody wants to roll over and let Hedley Lamar take over, you know, uh, the city. But he's like, well, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. And I've got a plan, yeah. you know? Yeah. So... Uh, 
at one point, you know, he he's he's equal parts Bugs Bunny and John Wayne. And I think that that makes him the most <laughs> interesting character in this movie mm-hmm. and the better, the, the best character in this movie <clears throat> next to uh, him and Jim. Um, yeah. and, and honestly, I think that's the point. Uh, it's It's to showcase that at the end of the day, you know, racism and discrimination is stupid. And Mike thinks Mel Brooks did this because Mel Brooks has likely seen his share of, of discrimination. He's mm-hmm. a very much a prominently big Jewish figure, you know, in, in the entertainment industry. Um, and he pokes fun of himself as well. Uh, and, and, you know, Ju- Judaism, his faith, all that. Um, so, so he knows what it's like to be uh, also to see his share of discrimination but also how stupid and ignorant people can be. And I think that that's what this movie ultimately is about um, and the best thing about it. So so Mike really loves the idea of uh, the satire here and uh, thinks that everything is strategically used um, to illustrate that point. So uh, Mike would like to ask Julie what Julie would think of all of this as well, since we didn't get <laughs> Julie's point of view. <laughs> This is hard. Um, Julie thinks that um, Julie agrees with Mike uh, for the most part on or for all of it, I guess um, that basically, yes, it was used very strategically. I agree. Um, I, I think it's just weird to hear like some of these things and, you know, we're just, again, we're so conditioned right now to be like oh that's that's bad it's a bad word you know that's bad you know but like but no but the way that it's used in this movie is so like well like placed like you said strategically put in these places to depict these characters in a certain way and and move the plot along and also depict a certain time period in time when this was happening a lot mm. Like this, it just was so. Like you know, the fact that like it's it's very funny, but also like no, this was actually happening back then. Like, yeah, like probably back when he made the film, and also even more so back when the westerns took yeah. place. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. I don't, There's and Julie Derek, doesn't know what yeah. else to <laughs> say about that. <laughs> I, d- d- Derek wants to ask: Are we done with this? Can we can we move? On? Did we claim it long enough? <laughs> How many more minutes for third person? <laughs> <laughs> we can sit in silence. For- I did see in the chat that he, that Eric also redeemed for punny for Mike. Oh wow! Oh um, <laughs> crap! Yeah. All right, well, I- well Der- Derek, I'll I'll keep doing it until we stop. Derek will keep doing it. Until- okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Um, I I think one of the things to your point, Julie, too, is that he. Mel Brooks, not only does he, you know, like we've all talked about the subversion and using those words very strategically, um, but one of the things I noticed in this rewatch is he really does kind of remove the power from those words um, by making yeah. every character that uses them the dumbest person you've ever mm-hmm. met. Like he he goes after the idea that all these people in power that use these words are essentially powerless and the words that they use have no meaning. The, the Heavily the Mark character is a great example of that because he is this person who thinks he's got this beautiful vocabulary and he's so smart and all of his ideas are brilliant and he is literally the dumbest person in the movie. Um, and, and that's intentional. And so not only is he strategic in how he uses those words, but he's also using them in a way that removes their power from them within the context of this. And then, Mike, you add that air of nobility around the one person that everybody in that time period and everybody in Westerns would often think is the dumbest person. And he imbues him with all of the smarts, all of the cleverness, all of the heroism, yeah. all of the John Wayne Looney Tunes who exist outside and inside the world that's being created. Um, and so those things that just really stick out to me as like, this is what we talk about when we talk about genius satire. And we talk about things that, yes, are controversial, but this is why they're so important and this is why they're being used so well. Absolutely. I, I agree. I was also going to just add one other thing, which is like, I, I like you were saying how Mel Brooks like, makes fun of himself. And I also think it's important to point out that he makes fun of everybody. Yes. So, like he makes fun of every race, every ethnicity, yeah. every type of person, like yeah. every trope. Like it's, 
which I, I do appreciate that as well. And he definitely, there's definitely all of that in this movie too. So. Let's, let's not forget, he plays a Native American in red paint yeah, who speaks yeah. Yiddish. Like, the, let's not forget right. that that exists in this movie too. Yes, it does. Um, I'm, I'm trying my hardest not to talk because I just can't think of a pun right now. But <laughs> You'll think of have. 50 when you don't have to. That's true. I know. No, like, literally, when whenever, spot, yeah, Jesus whenever Christ. you don't, I, yeah, I'm the same way. I can't, when I'm put on the spot, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> um, I, I want to shift things just a little bit uh, and ask, um, because this is such a seminal classic, because this isn't the first time that we've all seen it. Um, really, what what is... What is the best scene in this movie for you guys? <sighs> like, if you guys had to pick a scene that mm. just whenever somebody says Blazing Saddles, it's the first thing that you hear or you think of, uh, you know, that's that's what comes into mind. Jen, I'm going to start with you. Um, favorite scene in this movie, in the history of this movie? Um, I think the one that had me laughing the hardest when I rewatched it was when he tricked them by taking himself. Oh, so good. Oh, yeah. Oh so God! Crazy. I was like, "How did that work? How did that work?" It was that's how stupid they are. They were so mad that somebody sent this black guy to their town. They're willing to believe that somebody has him. Of course, someone took him hostage because there's a black guy in their town. Oh my God! What are we, somebody took him hot? They're gonna kill him. They're gonna kill him. <laughs> Such a crazy. So dumb. You are so, so good. good. So good. I, I was laughing. So I had to pause it because I just needed a minute. That was that was genius. And and he did the two. Vo- oh God, I was dying. Cleavon Little was perfect for that. Oh, he was so, mm, and wow. you know, agreed. Oh. So Richard Pryor was originally supposed to play the role, mm. but oh. they couldn't. Ins- the, the studio wouldn't insure him because of his fondness for substances. So he was he was a ah. liability. Um, I don't think he would have been as good as Cleavon Little. I agree. Because yeah. I don't think he could have played it as as the straight man like Cleavon yeah. needed to play it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's a certain charisma that Cleavon yeah. has mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. you know, it's a different kind of charisma than what Richard Pryor, like, it's totally chaotic. different. Like, that that scene that scene in particular requires a straightness and a, and a straightness of charm to be able to pull off that while I absolutely adore Richard Pryor, I don't think that that's, that scene would be a scene where you'd look at and be like, yeah, it's one of the best scenes in the movie. It, it, the whole, I, I'm just imagining him do that and just how wild it would be and how, like you said, chaotic. And the, the reason it plays so well is because it's so earnest. It's so authentic in the way that he's presenting it. Um, and that's what sells it. That, that's the beauty of that scene. Yeah, that's a yeah. great pick. That it's a wonderful be- pick. And then just the absurdity of when they're they're just magically on the Warner Brothers. <laughs> yes. And, Hands down, one of the best and endings on, to a movie ever. On the big dance scene. Oh, oh yeah. Another example of how mm-hmm. no group is safe. Yeah. yeah. Mel Brooks. Yep. <laughs> so I was like, so, yeah. Um, but then, and I think with this, there's not like one big scene. It's little. For me, it was just little things like, yeah. Um, we'll keep the N words. We'll keep. The C words, but not the Irish. All right, fine. Everybody. No. And I was like, hey, why not the Irish? <laughs> no, it's just, it was little things like that. There were just li- there's little things. And that was the thing is that's how clever he gets. He gets that clever minutia in there where you're like, hey. So, um, which of course, when I was, you know, probably seven when I saw this for the first time, I didn't appreciate, oddly enough, nor should I have. Um, but yeah, I think for sure for me, that was the, when he took himself hostage, that was my favorite. Oh man. Uh, Cleavon Little's a genius. And sure. as you know, Lily Von Stoop would tell you, uh, <laughs> he, should, <laughs> yeah. he, you know, he, he should, he definitely shouldn't, you know, he should change his name from Cleavon Little to Cleavon Big because Lily Von Stoop thought so. Um, it's sorry. True. It's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's my terrible pun. Hopefully, hopefully you like that. Harvest. That was for you. That was for you and Lily. Um, but anyways, uh, oh. yeah, no, um, uh, brilliant picks, Jen. Um, Julie, favorite scene. Okay, so like the scene that has been in my head since I was a child is the bean scene. Like the like just I don't I think now I can't say that that's my favorite scene, but it definitely still like. 
is is a scene that just just pops up in my head sometimes randomly <laughs> like just, especially when I just sometimes when you're just thinking about beans and like you're just like oh yeah that <laughs> that scene I mean it's just because like, it's so silly but it's so it's so funny it's so like you know you just you can't go wrong with a good fart joke so like, and that was like one of the biggest fart jokes I think I've seen in a movie so like um but yeah but like I think now like because this was you know that was from when I was like a kid like now I think um or at least younger younger a lot younger I don't remember exactly the first time I watched this but I know I saw like scenes of it pop up on tv when I was a kid so I definitely remember that scene for like I've remembered it for a long time but uh I would say um God, I mean it's hard to pick because I love all of the scenes between Cleavon and Jim I I really love the scene where like they just have the standoff and like you know um they pull out their guns and like he just shoots all of their guns out of their hands and they cut back to him and he's just standing there like you don't even oh, see yeah. his gun was taken <laughs> out or anything but like he just wiped <laughs> them all out and he's like give your applause to the Waco kid like you know um I really enjoy that one I just really enjoy any scene where like they best the the, the bad guys basically because it's just so ridiculous and fun and yeah it's brilliant uh I love those scenes too and in fact I think the bean scene is often you know cited as one of the the iconic moments in this movie that yeah, everybody yeah. just ends up loving um that and for me uh the introduction of mongo into the town mm. goes up to this guy who's on a horse and then he punches the horse <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just so bad i, I think mm. i think the lines end up popping out to me even more so than the scenes themselves because I, I think jen you covered uh one of my favorite scenes which is the ending scene uh you know julia you covered the bean scene but I think some of the lines are just golden, you know, where, you know, uh, their meet cute, Bart and Jim's meet cute, where he's like, uh, what you're you're my guest. I'm your host. What do you like to do? And he's like, well, I don't know. Play chess. Screw. screw. He's like, let's play chess. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking funny. Um, God, that's that's brilliant. And then just. Everything Gene Wilder does in this movie, I I am yeah. not giving him enough credit. Where he's just like, yeah, my name is Jim, but people call me Jim. Jim. And Jim. Just, <laughs> so good, and his his timing is. is I just They're such every a good duo together yeah. too. Like, it's, uh, yeah. like we didn't we didn't get a chance to see him and Richard Pryor together in this, uh, but then we got to see them together in at least four more movies after this because they were a good duo. We did not get mm. to see Cleavon Little and and Gene Wilder. In enough movies together, I wish we robbery. Did, honestly robbery. Um, yeah, that, Derek. Uh, so scene. yeah, so actually, uh, it's funny because that meet cute is one of my favorite scenes. Just that whole sequence. Yeah. Um, I I love watching those two together. They are just every scene they're in is great, but that first scene, um, him telling the story uh, and and doing the little <laughs> stupid little yeah. hands. I should have so hands. it's so dumb and it's so good and and wild. His ability to just sell the most like just sell the most insane comedic bits with just this brilliant straight face and art, like the earnestness that he has in his delivery is just absolutely magnificent um and and then the whole chess game where he steals the chess piece and he claps his head like that everything about that scene is just yeah. it's, it's just absolutely brilliant um and and yes i i would have killed for more wilder little combos like they they are just absolutely incredible together um and and it's a robbery that we don't get we didn't get more of them because they were both just so fantastic together i love prior and i love prior and wilder together they have that weird kinetic energy but these two are just the straight man and the straight man playing it for up for last it's just, yeah. oh god it's so good it's it's match made in heaven um and then honestly my second is anything with madeline khan i think her intro is just uh, it, it's just one of the best intros. Her, I'm tired. And that whole sequence of her doing that song and then just yeah. making, are you in show business? No, the get your feet off my stage. Like, yeah. just, <laughs> she just, she comes on too because the, for most of this film so far, outside of like the villains, everybody that we've seen are, are clearly outside of, all the villains are so dialed up to 11, right? They're, yeah. they're so over the top. They're clearly spoofs. Um, and then, you know, you get this intro of these two straight men, then you get Mongo, who's kind of a character, uh, 
And then you get her and she just has a whole different level of 11. Like she's on a different dial and she's clearly turned up. Like the satire of her character is like outrageously <laughs> hilarious and so dumb, but it's dumb in a completely different way. And, and what she brings to the table is just, Madeline Kahn is so good in this movie. In the brief time that we get her, like she's not yeah. used enough in my honest opinion, um, cause she is just so good in this movie. Um, so yeah, I love, I love her whole sequence from her intro to her interactions with Little and, and then her reactions after feeding in the giant sausages. <laughs> <laughs> What were those called? <laughs> Been there, snoot, or something? Yeah. 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 And he's like, no, no maybe 15 is my limit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. They're, they're so good. So th- those are so good. Those are probably my two favorite scenes in the movie because they're just all They're so good. There's a reason she got nominated for an Oscar for this for supporting yeah. actress. It's because she's, she's amazing. She's goddamn amazing. I don't think I actually realized that. And like. Yeah. Yeah. Props to her. I, I love Madeline Kahn. Obviously, I am channeling a yeah. little bit of Lily tonight. A little so. bit of Lily. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love the outfit, honestly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I've been neglecting the chat. I apologize, guys. I, I'm so sorry about this. Um, I know Heartless, you've been redeeming a lot of points, and we want you to keep redeeming points. You asked, uh, why not? I'm I don't use my points often. Agreed. Uh, you should use your points as much as you want. Uh, just not on singing. Um <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, two two quick ones. Uh, everybody hydrate really quickly. I will. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm I'll drinking. Hydrate there. For just... you. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. And then stretch. <laughs> this one I could do. So oh, yeah. stretch. And then one more. Uh, one more redemption. Um, which is uh, and and actually, heartless. I'm going to get to your redemption of this one because I think it's going to lead to a discussion, but. Uh, before I do, Cue Ball also mentioned Mel Brooks gets a lot of crap from people, and I'm censoring that. Uh, you know that they couldn't believe he made John Wayne uh, to say the N word, and John John Wayne, I guess, came to Mel's. Oh, John Wayne came to Mel's defense and said that uh, he didn't make me. I read the script, I loved it, and he just pointed out the react the racism of what was going on uh, still today in this film. Yeah, so uh, great, great points, Cue Ball. I didn't even realize that about uh, John Wayne being in this movie, which is probably just you know m- my ignorance. I, if he was in this in a cameo role, that's kind of it's kind of awesome, and I'm glad that uh, you know John Wayne understood the satire of this. This is great. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, and then heartless, you redeemed a poll. Uh, and you asked who we think would be a, the casted in a remake of this movie, Ooh. which Ooh. first off, I hope never happens. Because yeah, right. Yeah, no. Oh Unfortunately, um, if if I were to cast anyone, it would probably be Michael Sarah, uh, Samuel L. Jackson, and a few other people. But you'd make them dogs instead of uh, dogs and cats instead of. And I'm 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 being facetious here because literally, Blazing Saddles was remade in two thousand in twenty twenty two as Wait, a computer animated comedy called Pause of Fury: The Legend of Hank, where Michael yeah. Sarah played a dog, That's Samuel right. L. Jackson played right. a cat, Ricky Gervais. I did not know this. Yes, yeah. Mel Brooks was also in the movie as well. What? This was inspired by Blazing Saddles and was given Mel Brooks' blessing to actually do this. It is not a good movie. I actually had to cover it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it was actually remade. No one's going to ever know that and remember that. Yeah, Heartless is like, what? Um, yeah. but, I saw yeah. a trailer for that, but I never made the connection, so they must Be- not have done a good job. Yeah. They did not do a good job because it went from, uh, you know, cowboy western to samurai movie, but the dog was yeah, that's interesting. The, the sheriff uh, in a land full of cats, and then the cats were racist to the dog sheriff. Mm. Was, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, okay. Blazing, <laughs> Blazing Saddles for Kids, sure. Yes. Why not? Blazing Saddles for Kids. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Only not good. It kind of makes you want to watch it, though. I'm not gonna lie. I know. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm sure I skipped it because I just had no desire to go down that rabbit hole. But now, now I might. Um, Cat owner, I'm a. Thinker. We can hate watching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this is yeah. this is such a challenging question because I there I just don't know who who would be. I mean, oh God. 
because I, I wouldn't want somebody who has I, I don't know I honestly don't know these these roles are so perfectly cast with, with yeah. people who are just timeless in, in the things that they do um because I, I'm trying to think of like comedians that get it like you know I'm thinking of people like Jamie Foxx and Kevin Hart and um you, you know these even Samuel Jackson like these people that get pretty much most of those roles right now and yeah. I wouldn't want any of them any no. of them to yeah. play this role like well, not, not a single I, person that's prominent right now i would want to play this role yeah, yeah i agree i think i would I mean, want like an unknown maybe to play yeah and, and then yeah. replacing gene, gene wilder too though it's like there really yeah. isn't anybody like i mean like who are they gonna replace him with timothy so, chalamet yeah, <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say we've already tried twice with wonka and it has not gone well so maybe Maybe we leave uh, we leave the Gene Wilder roles alone, guys. Yeah, Jen, what were you gonna no, say? Please, because like I just don't think anyone. It, it's not that like you know no one can be as good of an actor as him, but right. just that his style yeah. is so unique and different yeah, was... than so many actors, especially actors today, are just not the same like wit and charisma and style yeah. that he had. So like, yeah. yeah, it would just be I I couldn't even think of. I mean, I I would I would want to go with unknowns, I think, and maybe or maybe like people from Saturday Night Live, I would say, could like maybe pull it off because mm-hmm. they're they have a lot of things to pull off. But I wouldn't even <clears throat> want to see that. Like, yeah. yep. Jen, what were you gonna say? I, I don't know about this class of Saturday Night Live. Um, not yeah, maybe not the most. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree. Thing. Yeah. My first my first thought when you said recast it, my brain immediately flashed on an image of Idris Elba in the Dark Tower, which I haven't seen because oh. I'm a huge Stephen King fan. It's not good. Yeah, it's not good. And, it's and not good. You, you did the right <laughs> thing. <laughs> don't, don't do that. But, and I really want Mike Flanagan to make it as a series. Like, that's my dream. Because yeah. I think he would Dark Tower, yeah. Tower. Yeah. But yeah. I won't see the movie. But Idris Elba in that, like, Western garb of... Yeah. Of, and I'm like, oh, I can see that. Because he, yeah. he can do funny. And yeah. he's cool as a cucumber. And he's mm-hmm. easy on the eye. I mean, he would he could hit all the he could check all the boxes. Yeah, <laughs> um, I I would you know now that you say that because it, it made me think of the harder they fall, which actually has all of those people in in that yeah. movie. Um, and the the one that I might actually go with uh, would probably be some, and and I don't even know that I would pick him, but somebody along the lines of the Keith Stanfield, um, mm. who, who I think That's has good. the potential to play comedy straight i mean if you've seen like sorry to bother you um even the book of clarence which isn't that good um but he does do he does have that ability to play very strong comedy i mean especially in sorry to bother you like that's such a strong satirical type of movie about capitalism and and you know corporate culture today uh and he plays that role very straight um but it's also a satire so that that's kind of the person i envision uh, when yeah. I think of uh, when I think of somebody to to play that role, um, mm. alongside yeah. I I think um, Jeremy Allen White has yeah, been the top contender. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he mainly he, just because he looks like a reincarnated version of Gene Wilder. Have you seen? <laughs> See, I haven't seen the Bear, and I don't think I've really seen Jeremy mm. Allen White act, so I can't really form an opinion on that one. But he's great. He's, he's, he's he is a he is a great actor. Like he's okay. he's legitimately one of our best younger generation actors yeah. working today. Like he's he's great. Just a clickbait article that says he is Gene Wilder's grandkid because that's the stupidest thing. But <laughs> <laughs> and know that there is an episode in season two that will traumatize you tremendously. Yeah. But the next episode is like a soothing blanket that will hug you. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good pick, Mike. I, I think that's a good. I think not even just because he looks like him, but I've seen him yeah. tap into some of the quirkier part. Like he's very dramatic. Um, but if you've ever seen Fingernails, which is a movie I like, but I know nobody else does, um, he that's a very like small kind of role where there is a lot of comedy, but it's very dry. So he's got to play the whole thing incredibly straight. And I, I think of his roles in that vein, and he might actually you pair those two together. I think you might be able to make this work. It would still be awful and it won't even touch the original, but since this is an assignment, we have to do it. I think those would be the two that I would go with. Yeah. So Lakeith Stanfield and Jeremy Allen White. That that's what I would pick. That, that's yeah, okay. I, I would do that. Yeah. All right. 
let let really a strong comedic uh director and writer kind of handle something like this too like uh yeah. Cord Jefferson who just did American yes. fiction yes. um yeah, yeah, yeah. might do a really good job with with doing something like that but I honestly feel like if any Hollywood executive were to approach any director in Hollywood to try and do this all of them would say no because oh yeah no yeah. unless you're doing it in a dog and cat version of <laughs> 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 Let's do it in a cute animated oh. version. <laughs> yeah. Um no. yeah. Let's let's have Lily von Stipp and uh Bart have make love and but with cats and dogs. Um I don't know. That's <laughs> I know um, I know you're trying to no sell this film, Mike, but you're kind of selling me on this film. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> like the harder you try to no sell it, the more interested I am in this. <laughs> So we hope you viewers out there enjoyed our nom talk for Pause of Fury. Yes, the legend of Hank. Uh, oh my gosh. All, all things considered, guys. Um, honestly, I, I wish I could do this like the rest of the evening. Um, this was so much fun. And honestly, I feel like we barely scratched the surface of anything. There's a That's a Pause of Fury pun, by the way. Um, hey! But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, that being said, I I really enjoyed this, and I enjoyed talk talking to you guys about it. Everyone had such amazing things to say, and I'm I'm so grateful that we we got to relive this movie together, um, and 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 just enjoy and bond over our love of Mel Brooks. So, with that said, uh, I'm going to put it out on outros right now. Uh, Derek, where can everyone find you? Uh, yeah, so you can find me on most social medias at D Rock Comedy. That's D R O K Comedy. Um, and then you can also find all of my stuff on nerdbot.com, um, tons of reviews. And then you can also follow me on Letterboxd, which is also D-Rock Comedy. Um, I don't, I can't do full pieces for every movie that I watch. So some of them get quick pun reviews and all of those will be on Letterboxd. <laughs> we love it, sir. Um, always, always bring the puns, especially when somebody redeems nom talk points. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Julie, where can everyone find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram at jraylin, J-R-A-E-L-Y-N. And I'm also on that clock app, the TikTok at jraylady, J-R-A-E-L-A-D-Y. Those are my primaries. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and Jen, uh, last but not least, where can everyone find you? <laughs> oh, oh I think the sound uh, got oh. knocked out. There, there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, my throat actually went dry is what happened there oh no uh, <laughs> no you can find me um on instagram do underscore as underscore peggy says you can also find me on letterbox i'm trying to be much better with my reviews and my son is very proud of me for it um <laughs> I, but it's just peggy says um mike has read some of my reviews i have and um, i love your I love reviews it. on letterbox oh, by the way very, yes I have mike do we time. follow each other on letterbox uh, I don't think so. I, 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 I'm very much not active, but that's why I recommend following Jen because we, we share very similar thoughts okay. and her All sense right. of acerbic humor is just brilliant. I okay. did learn okay. not to comment on any of Mike Flanagan's, um, sassy posts. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> from Madam Web. I'm still getting Madam Web notifications. <laughs> from I, 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 did, I did that once on a, on a Babylon trash yeah. and I, I jumped on to agree with the Babylon trash. And I, this was like two years ago, and I still get yeah. notifications of somebody commenting on a Babylon post yeah. from forever ago. Yeah. He basically tweaked the AMC Nicole Kidman script, um, and that was his review of Madam Web, and I just made a little- Yes, oh, so good. I saw that, it's so good. <laughs> oh God, so I'm good. gonna get comments on this until I die. Um, yeah, and then also, um, the West Coast Avengers are a cosplay volunteer group that Mike is in with me, and we um, are going to be ramping up with our springtime events here, um, Ronald McDonald House and things like that. And we are at California Avengers. Woo. That's right. As if you guys didn't know, I was into cosplay. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> and and as always, you guys can find me at Boy 182 on Instagram, Twitter, all that, but primarily on uh, my site, The Nerds of. Well, uh, the site that I write for it, the nerds of color .org, uh, the what's what to watch .com as well. And that's it. Uh, uh, that's it. L.A. Ugh, I'm having trouble with words today, guys. Um, but uh, honestly, thank you guys for joining us. So grateful for this. And until next time, happy trails, guys. See ya. Happy trails. <laughs>